patients with myelodysplastic syndrome, risk stratification is actually fairly important. It's just not all that easy. And uh, what we're going to talk about today are some somatic mutations in MDS patients that are associated with clinical features, and they predict prognosis independent of the revised IPSS. Uh, and we're talking with Dr. Rafael Behar, who is an MD, PhD. He's an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the UC San Diego Moore's Cancer Center. Uh, before we get to that, risk models and uh, the ones that include mutation information, they have been proposed, they're just not widely used. You know, several different groups have shown that mutations can add information to the IPSSR and other prognostic scoring systems in MDS, but there still isn't a consensus on how best to use this information or how even best to test for it. So our group is trying to amass data from around the globe to see if we can identify the best understanding of how these mutations impact prognosis and how we might in the future actually come to a consensus on how to use them. This is a pretty large study that you've got. It is. It was made possible only by the contributions of centers around the globe. We have many centers in Europe, in the U.S., even in Asia, 18 total centers contributing over 3,500 samples of this effort. And so what have you found so far? This is an interim result of our meta-analysis and by pooling all 3,500 uh, 3, of these patients We've been able to identify many genes that have independent prognostic significance of the IPSSR and estimate what that independent risk is. What we're using this for is to build some potential models that we might go forward with in a larger study that the IWG is working on next year to actually sequence samples prospectively that, so that way they, they're all done on the same platform and analyzed in the same way. And we're going to combine these two cohorts, which at that point will be close to over 5,000 patients in order to come up with a consensus model. So how long do you think it's going to be before there is something that can be used? Many people are using these mutational informations in practice today, but they're using them in really to refine their understanding of prognosis a little bit. So patients, for example, who are on the border of high risk versus low risk, clinicians might use mutations to push them one way or the other. And I think that within the next year to two years, we'll have all the data together and be able to put together a very robust consensus model that has the backing of many centers around the globe. How difficult will it be to use, do you think? Well, that's one of our major considerations. We can be really precise, yes. but at the expense of complexity. And we really want to make something that's practical, that clinicians can use in their daily practice, you don't necessarily uh, you know, have to spend a lot of time on the internet or plugging things into a calculator to figure out. So we, that's one of our major considerations, is how can we reduce the data to a point that it's actually manageable and usable. Just a couple of months ago, our editor-in-chief, Dr. Mikhail Sikaris of the Cleveland Clinic, he co-authored a paper, Molecular Testing in Myelodysplastic Syndromes for the Practicing Oncologist. Will the progress fulfill the promise? I'm going to ask you the same question. How would you answer that? Dr. Sikaris and I have been on opposite sides of this debate, sometimes <laughs> artificially so, but uh, he, he makes some great points in there, and we, we take all of his recommendations to heart. Uh, his group actually is one of the contributors to our, to our project. And in order to fulfill that promise, I think we not only have to have uh, our kind of a stamp of approval of, of many different groups suggesting that this is really the way to go, but we also need to make it really accessible to people. So not only are we asking this, the, the model itself to not be too complex, but we're going to ask that the thing, the information that physicians need to get from their patients be accessible, that the testing be available, that it not be cost prohibitive, and that the interpretation be relatively straightforward. Well, congratulations, because it sounds like it's an exciting opportunity to, uh, to get a lot of patients and some big numbers. When you do the, the next set, how many patients will you eventually be studying in order to get the f what you think is the final product? So the, the first half of the study that we're presenting today is retrospective data. This is data that centers already had, sequencing data they already had on their own patients. The next stage of the project will be to take samples from these centers and actually sequence them all together on the same platform. When we combine our two efforts, we'll have well over 5,000 samples with which to draw conclusions from. Well, whether it's the, uh, the journal itself or online, please check out all of our coverage from ASH 2015. For ASH Clinical News, I'm Rick McGuire.